This lesson is about task queue. If you thought memcache is cool being able to take whole layers of caching that you could share between all those instances, task queue is so much cooler. It's just amazing what you can do with it and how much you could enhance your application and make it more scalable and reliable. What is task queue and why do I love it so much? The different kinds of task queues that we have, the push and the pull queue, as well as cron jobs or scheduled tasks. A task is just a unit of work. For example, let me write an object to the data store or send an email, something that could be a compartmentalized unit of function or something that you'd want to run out of the user context. For example, if the user runs a web page and that web page does something and then uses an email, it doesn't make sense for that user to sit there waiting for that email to be sent. Task queue is a great way to take that piece of work and put it on a different queue while it automatically processes in the background while the user's request continues processing. All versions of your applications share the same queue. A push queue is really for automatic execution. You push something on a queue and it will immediately execute it. Pull queue is slightly different where you can actually put a piece of work on this queue and then you can take a lease from it by a worker thread that you can control, like how fast you pick up those queues as well as where you pick them up from, whether it's compute engine or on-premise system. There's a few basics about all tasks. Each one has a name when you put it on the task queue. If you don't specify one, it will automatically generate one. If you try to put a task on the queue with the same name, it will actually fail. I have here the top and the bottom. The task on the top is the type of parameters that you can control for a push queue. And the bottom is the type of data and parameters that you can have for a pull queue. Notice there's a lot more information about a push queue. The reason why is that a push queue, a good way of thinking about it is it's just a URL along with some parameter options that are going to be executed on one of your front end instances. And it's going to try to do this as quickly as possible. You could put some quality and control around the queue. And the way you do that is different for the two types of queues. The push queue, you put these pieces of work on the queue and it will get executed as quickly as possible. It may cause a lot of instances to be spun up, so you have to be careful about how many you put on or at least how quickly that queue is going to drain and send tasks to your application. One nice feature is on front ends, you normally have a 60 second deadline where the request has to be completed by. If that request is initiated by a task queue, then you have a full 10 minutes to finish that request. If you do it on the back end, of course, you have unlimited amount of time to finish that request. But when you are creating a push queue, you are limited to 100 kilobytes of total data with that request. Since this is just a standard request that comes from a user to your application, you can have either a GET request or a POST request, and you can have a whole payload that is that POST body, just like someone is posting a form to your application. A POST queue, however, you have an instance that you would spin up and you would then go to that queue and get a lease on some tasks. You could crunch through your work, and then when you're done with that work, you'd go and see that you would delete that task, essentially saying that you've completed the processing for that task. We have a complete REST interface over the pull queue. This allows you then to run your worker from anywhere. It could be on-premise, it could be another app engine instance, either front ends or back ends. You have a maximum of one megabyte in task size. Unlike a push task, where you have parameters that get posted or get appended as the request, this is actually a piece of data that when you release the task, you get that data back. Every queue you have in your system, you can actually name and put in parameters about that queue. For example, how frequently or fast you're going to process these tasks, or how large a token bucket is. The basic concept is, we use a token bucket algorithm in order to limit how frequently or how quickly we drain or process your tasks. You can have a bunch of queues that you can create and you can specify different parameters, but you also have a default queue that's already set for you. And its name is just 
default. Also by default, there is an unlimited concurrent request. If you have a lot of requests on this task queue, it's going to start saving them and try to process as many as possible. Unless you control it, it will start to spin a lot of front-end instances. For example, an illustration here is that you have one queue that says one request currently and maybe faster. Think of it as a bigger pipe. Whereas maybe another queue that says I only want to process one concurrently. And that's a smaller pipe. That kind of funnels the traffic into one at a time and would prevent more and more instances from being spun up. Unless you specify otherwise, every single task that you put on the queue is going to be executed by the same version that initiated that task. So if you're the default application, it's going to go on that queue and then it's going to try to execute that URL on the default version of that application. If you're in, say, version 3 of your application and you execute a task in that version, it's going to go back to version 3. You can override this behavior as well. What's nice about this is if you deploy a new version of that application and put something on the task, and even though the tasks are shared, it's going to go back to the same version that you deployed. So you could test new functionality out, and you don't have to worry about it calling between different applications. So what does this mean? Well, let's say that you have a processing rate of one second. You have a bucket size of five. So you get seven new tasks. Well, you're going to execute the first five tasks right away, but it's going to have to wait for a second later to get another token to execute the sixth task, and then again for the seventh task. Another way of showing this is on a timeline. Every time we execute a task, we use one of these tokens, but now we wait for that token to come back and fill up the bucket again. If we increase that rate to two seconds, then of course you still can consume the same five tokens right away. But you get a new token halfway through that because it's every half second. You get a new token when you execute the seventh task, sixth, and seventh task. So this is how you could really control how frequently and how quickly you execute the tasks and here you get more and more tokens. And the way you would configure it is these have different parameters. The task retry limit, which is the minimum number of times to retry the task before it fails. And some of these are used in conjunction with one another. So you can also have task retry time, which is the minimum amount of time to retry a task. So in this example, the minimum and maximum backup seconds have to do with how long you wait between subsequent retries. The max doubling is how much of an exponential back off you're getting. So to put all these things together, if we have that retry limit of one, the retry limit of four seconds, which is really the minimum number of times we're going to try to attempt it, and the minimum max back off of one second to four seconds, we'll see that the first time we fail a task it retries it a second later. But we've already now gone over that one minimum retry limit. But we're going to keep trying because we haven't yet hit the minimum time we want to continue a retry. So then if it fails a second time, we retry it again. And we still yet haven't hit that first second. So we're going to try. Try it again. And each time we're getting a little bit longer because of that doubling. But since we've satisfied at this point, both the retry limit of one and the retry limit of four seconds, we're then going to fail that task and not continue to retry it. So let's say that we increase the retry limit to number five, but we keep the same minimum and max back off seconds. You notice that the minimum back off is one second. And so the first time it retries is going to be one second. And I'm using seconds for illustrations. Usually it isn't terribly accurate because it could take longer to execute the tasks. You are usually dealing with minutes or hours for these types of retries. Now we double it, though, to two seconds and to three seconds. Essentially we keep multiplying by the number of seconds that we identify as the minimum back off seconds. And the max doubling is what controls the increment of each time. Since I have zero, that means it's not going to double it's going to increase my minimum by that amount each time. My minimum is one second, so it would be one second. 
If I had a max doubling, they would go from 1 to 2 to 4, etc., until you have the maximum number of times it would be doubled. Zero just simply means keep incrementing by that one second. So you'll see that we've hit four seconds here, but our max back off is four seconds, meaning don't keep extending it beyond four seconds. So now every subsequent request is going to retry every four seconds. Until we satisfy both the minimum number of times we want to retry as well as the amount of time we want to keep retrying for. Since we've tried five times, we're greater than four seconds and that would be over here. We would then stop after that last request. Here's a simple code to put a task on the queue. It's so easy just to say, here's my URL and here's my parameter. Then this is going to automatically submit a post request to the parameter of IDs equal one, two, and three. It's literally that easy. Then you would of course program whatever handler you would want to do to handle that forward slash worker request. In Python, it's very similar format. One of the most challenging concepts is how do we limit the rate of tasks that are being executed and really what's happening underneath the hood? We use a token bucket algorithm and think of it literally as a bucket that has tokens. If we have a refill rate of one second, which means we want to process it once a second, then every second we take a new token and we put it right in this bucket. If the bucket's already full with our max bucket size, then we just disregard that token. So you can always have a bucket that's constantly being refilled. Whenever we execute a new task, it's going to take one of those tokens out of the bucket and execute the task. So that means we're going to start taking a bunch of tokens. But once that bucket is empty, we can't process that request until a new token gets added to the bucket. Within one second, that token would be replenished. Another way of showing this is on a timeline. Every time we execute a task, we use one of those tokens. But now empty, and we wait for that token to come back and fill up the bucket again. If we increase that rate to two seconds, then of course you can still consume the same tokens right away. But you get a new token halfway through that because it's every half a second. You get a new token when you execute the seventh task, sixth, and seventh task. So this is how you could really control how frequently and how quickly you execute the task. And here you get more and more tokens. So let's say you want to delete a task. There's a couple of ways to do that. One is you could go through your admin interface in a console and just purge the whole task. Or actually check on individual tasks and delete them. Or you could do that programmatically through code. In Java you would just load the queue and then you would delete the task by specifying the task name. So if you had told it or didn't give it a task name when you created the task, you would know which task to delete. So you would have to correlate it, figure it out, then do that deletion. If you had specified the same task, then of course you could just use that name very easily. You could also just purge the entire queue, which would delete all tasks. Another nice feature though in the task queue is that you can schedule tasks based on part of the transaction. We're talking about the data store. So let's say you wanted to add something to the data store and then you wanted to trigger off a process that would go through and update an average for some reason. Perhaps you have a plus one button and every time someone pluses it, you want to get the average of or count of, for example, you would increment that count in a separate task but you only want to actually schedule that task if that data store transaction was successful. And so this is how you would do it as part of a transaction. When tasks are actually calling your application, there are a few different headers that are automatically added. Something that's nice about these headers is that the App Engine system automatically strips everything that begins with anything that we add ourselves. We'll strip it if someone tries to spoof that, send a request to your application. And so if these headers exist, you can rely that they're actually added by our own infrastructure and not by someone trying to trick you. Your name, task queue, pretty self-explanatory. We try to count the number of times it's been retried. Execution count is the number of times it's been executed. And tasking TA, which is roughly how long until it's going to be executed. 
Another nice feature of task is that you can also specify, if you want it to be right away, you can specify how long until you want it to be run. That is, I want it to be run in a thousand seconds, or at a particular date and time. Then there's also a header that you can set when you're creating a new task. And this is a situation, let's say, that you are using task to call the back end. But back end could be dynamic, or it could be something you control yourself. But you don't want to spin up a new back end instance if one's not already running. So let's say you have a bunch of batch processing that you want to do at a particular time and you don't want to spend the 15 minutes of automatically sp spinning up the back end and then spinning it down. Well, this is a great way to do it. If the back end's not up, the task would wait in that queue until that back end is brought online, and then it will process the tasks. So pull queue is you don't really have a URL that you call. You just simply have a piece of work that needs to be released by a worker. And this is great for processing something off-site or a batch operation, or something that doesn't really need to have that front-end request that's initiated, but rather you want to pull a bunch of tasks and do a bunch of work in one thread. The way this simply works is that you put the task on that queue, and then all work will come and say, I want to lease one of the tasks. It gets that lease, and no other worker can get a lease on that task for as long as your lease is good for. You can specify a time pretty much like a timeout or an expiration for that lease. If you don't respond before that timeout happens, then some other worker could pick up that task and start processing it. Once you're done processing it, your worker has to actually go back and delete the task so that it's done and no other worker will pick it up. Here's how you would code a pull queue. Java versus Python code is very similar. You just get the new queue and you give it the name of that queue, and you put a new task onto it. And set the lease here for an hour or 3600 seconds, and I want to pull 100 tasks. That's going to give you an array list of tasks that you can then crunch through. So if you only get one task, you would specify one. This pull queue has the REST interface that's currently under experimental, but I know a lot of people that use it. Keep that in mind, though. If you run into an issue in contact support, they'll say it's experimental. They'll try to help you. You can specify an ACL. So who can actually pull tasks from this list? That's if you're going to use something outside of App Engine. If you want other workers running on Rackspace or on-premise, for example. This is used for on-premise processing when you do batches that you might pull data from a financial or some other system that's on-premise. They don't want a direct connection to. You can have a branch process running on-premise. Then you can upload the data to your app. You could try this out on the Google API Playground or the Auth Playground to see how it all works. So some of the best practices is like an end user request. This end user request doesn't actually have a user associated with it. So if you use the user API to call up who's calling it, it will say no one's logged in. However, this is treated as an admin request. So if you had protected your application so that the URL that was being called by the task queue is protected, so it could be called by an admin user, then it can also be called by a task queue. That's the way that you can make sure that something on the internet's not just trying to hit the URL and trigger whatever the task could trigger. Yet, as an admin, when you're logged in, you'll be able to trigger it yourself because it will treat you as an admin as well. So the best practice is to set the security to only allow endpoints to be accessed by an admin role, unless, of course, you don't care and maybe you want to open publicly. Use different queues for different purposes. So let's say that you have a lot of very fast requests that come in. Well, it's much better to use different queues so that you could specify parameters on those queues to do different processing rates. You don't want to have a thousand reports spin up at the same time. Each one could take five minutes to process. That's going to spin up a lot of front-end instances if you're doing it that way. Whereas you'd want that throughput for something that's small, quick, and fast request. You could actually, just like a lot of our APIs, match up task creation. The only limitation is that you can't do more than 100 tasks per batch. This is great because you're going to have a lot less usage than your API quota for the task queue, as well as it could be much faster. So it will cost less and it will perform faster. 
Finally, there's a few best practices for pull cues. Since we're not going to automatically trigger this task for your instances, you have to determine how quickly you want to spin workers up to pull leases. It's something you have to control yourself. You should make sure you choose a lease time that is close to the worst case scenario. Otherwise, you run into a situation where something's still being worked on and the lease expires and a different worker pulls that task and starts executing that request as well. So the next topic is cron. I like to call them scheduled tasks. It's really just a task on the task queue. There are schedules to run at certain intervals. Just it hits that URL and the application runs as an admin and you could go on. And for all intents and purposes, you could treat it just like any other task queue that's being executed. If you've got an admin console, then you have a queue that's there named underscore underscore cron. And you can actually go on in the admin console and pause that queue and it will stop processing all your cron jobs. You can also tweak a lot of the different details about the queue. You can't control the parameters like how frequently it executes them, but you can purge them. But you can also pause a queue. So if something starts going crazy, you could just pause and wait for it to finish. And then it's working okay, you could resume it all and just take off where it left off. So for cron jobs, you would specify those in cron.xml or cron.yaml. And the important thing is you have to have at least the URL, and that's the URL that's being called, as well as the schedule. The schedule is actually in pretty plain English, like every 24 hours, means once every 24 hours to execute. You could also specify if you want the target version of your application to call. Now there's a few parameters that you have in these cron jobs. One is the URL on the schedule, but you could also specify the time zone. So you want to say 5 p.m. in a particular time zone, call the task. Now there's also a special parameter here called synchronized. And what that means is if it's synchronized, every single minute to call it regardless of how long the task took to run. Whereas if you don't say synchronized, let's say the task takes two minutes to run and you want to run it every two minutes, so it runs for the two minutes and then it waits another two minutes and then it runs it, effectively kicking off the cron job every four minutes because it took that two minutes to execute. So now when a cron job is being executed, the admin header that says xcron app engine is true. And that's how you can tell that it has actually come from cron versus the task queue. Just like the task queue, you'd want to secure this using admin. But if you actually don't specify admin and you specify just have to be logged in as a user, it will fail. Because remember, there's no user associated with either task queue or with the cron job. But it comes in as an admin or it passes the admin flag. Now that you have 20 different cron jobs in free applications, if you need, you could have up to 100.